There's a popular phrase we Americans are familiar with, especially those of us who live around the city of New York, melting pot. What does it translate into? Well, basically it means combining several different things to produce one common item. In the case of the city and the country, a very unique society. In the case of a company like Model Power, a very well unique train company with very unique train sets. Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy, and today's review is going to be of a Model Power train set. It is important for me to note before I go any further that Model Power has been out of business for a couple of years. That said, their sets are still around, so they're still relevant. And like I said at the beginning, like all Model Power sets, this is a bit of a hodgepodge of several different companies' toolings, all kind of assembled to make one unique train set. As you see, the track layout is a very basic 36-inch circle with absolutely no... I'd also like to point out that this set, due to, of course, the fact that it's electronic and, of course, has small parts, is not appropriate for anyone under the age of 14. As we also see by this picture, this particular set is equipped with Model Power's Easy Track knockoff locket. And despite the pictures of the SW1200 leading the train in Conrail paint, there is a Conrail paint locomotive, but it's in fact an RS2. In my opinion, actually a better choice, a much nicer locomotive to look at. But then again, I'm biased since I love Alco, since I always have loved and love Alcos. Anyway, let's go get started here and get the box open. Again, this is a used set. It's had some mileage on it before, and we'll see that does kind of lead to it not being in perfect shape. As we open the lid, we reveal the contents of the inside of the box. Next, remove the large cardboard spacer that holds all the other rolling stock items as we're greeted with first in place. And also, as we see, protects the track system as well as the transformer. And it's really kind of stunning to see just how much free space there is inside this box. It makes you wonder exactly why Model Power chose such a big box. I'm thinking this is more or less another attempt by the company to try to use the same box across all of the different train sets they did provide back in the day. Anyway, let's take a good look at the instructions quickly. As you can see, again, this has been used. They've clearly been bounced around a bit. Who knows how long this set was in storage before I got my hands on it. And we'll start with taking a look at one of the freight cars, in this case, the Caboose. This is, again, by Model Power. I believe this to be from their Marks tooling. Nothing fancy, very crude detailing on it, as we see. And shockingly enough, and this is a detail that'll be true of the entire train set, it actually uses horn hook couplers. And this is a pretty recent train set itself. I think this was out in the up to, I think, all the way up until the company went out of business in 2014, so it just shows to show you that some of the sets weren't quite straight. Though I think, actually, this might be an earlier one, so I could be wrong on that one. Next, we have the Recycle Car, which I believe is a Mahano model in this case. Again, equipped with horn hook couplers. Again, with, as with the caboose, I forgot to mention before, plastic wheels. And as you see, a under-mounted weight to keep the, give the car a very low center of gravity and keep the weight right down where it needs to be. Nice little touch there by Model Power. Next, let's take a look at what should be a 40-foot Penn Central hopper car, mm. or at least it should have been, but as we can see, the box is very clearly, well, empty. <laughs> not clear as to what happened here. Again, this is a used set. Uh, not sure exactly why that isn't there, but it isn't. Now let's take a look at this Denver and Rio Grande gondola car. Again, I believe this to be Mahano tuning. I do not believe that this is the Marks tuning, tooling, or it could be, because again, th these were hodgepodge sets. And yet again, we see it is with horn hook couplers, not knuckle couplers, despite the age in which the set was built, which is sometime to what I think 2010 or just before 2010. Not sure of the exact date. Over here, we have the wires for the actual transformer. We will see exactly the reason why this does not have a plug on it in a second. This is kind of crude. And it again, has the hooks that go onto the transformer. Same traditional stuff as we saw in my earlier model powertrain set review. Anywho, let's take a look at the RS2 locomotive, the part pretty much everyone's been waiting for. This engine back in the day, which was developed by Mehano, I believe, for Varney Industries, was known for its mechanics on it. Originally, it was, it was rear-wheel drive only. This particular unit, as we see, is the latter one with the all-wheel drive center point-mounted motor, similar to what Atherin is, sort of a bathy Atherin blue box engine, except only a three-pole motor, so don't completely mistake it for it, though it does have all-wheel drive, much like the Atherins did. And the all-wheel drive is a huge bonus, as it gives this locomotive incredible pulling power, especially for such a basic machine. And you're taking a good look at this engine, as we can see here, that the dimensions are actually pretty accurate on this one. It was pretty revolutionary at the time, and it's ironically enough thanks to its very basic drivetrain from the era, which was in that case a truck or sort of pancake-style drive system. Ironically enough, the lack of flywheels allowed the locomotive shell to be narrow enough to represent the proper dimensions of a model of an RS2, which would not have been possible due to the flywheels in the Atherman design motors of the time. It was later upgraded to this one, 
Again, the detailing is a bit on the crude side, and as we can see right there, that's the screw that actually mounts the motor cradle that holds the motor in place down. But it does the job, and the hood dimensions are actually correct on that. The horns are, the uh, railings, pardon me, are a little bit overdone in terms of their width and stuff, and you can see here the removing tab right there, that little removing point underneath the cab is very prominent. That's where you stick your screwdriver in to get the cab off, as this is held in place with snaps, no screws. Not an expensive locomotive, but decent enough, and I used to always love these because they had great pulling power because they were all-wheel drive. And then, of course, here we move on to the instructions of the set itself, and sort of a, the annoying, of course, sales brochure showing you what other train sets the company had available. Again, boasting the company's newly reverse-engineered locket roadbed. Again, kind of inspired, if you will, from Bachman's best. We also see that there is a comprehensive disassembly guide for the locomotive itself, as well as a parts order form. Not so helpful now because model power is, of course, well long since kaput. Next, let's take a good look at the power pack slash transformer included in this set. And yes, if it looks familiar, yes, it is in fact the same power pack slash transformer included in that basic model power set I reviewed a couple of weeks to, a, I think it was a week, in fact, actually a month ago now, back. Same basic design, red le lever and all. Again, a bit on the crude side, but does the trick. And here is, of course, the famous locket roadbed. Now, I'm sure many of you out there have probably come to the very understandable conclusion that this is, to paraphrase a certain British automotive journalist, just a bunch of Bachman Easy Track with Easy Track crossed out and Locket Roadbed written in in crayon. But in fact, no, it is actually a little bit different if we take a look at the distinct hook in the front there. We also note the call to control isn't quite up to par as we can already tell there's a little rust coming through on this. Anyway, let's get a piece of easy track out just to prove that I'm not going crazy here and that there is a difference. As you can see here by the Bachman, again, steel alloy, alloy in this case, easy track, there is a noticeably different hook on it. I have gotten these to work together, but they are distinctively different track. And again, the model power is, again, sort of a cheap inversion, as ever, ages as that comment sounds. Also, if we look very carefully at the base of this section of track, as I try to get this into focus, it does, in fact, say model power on it. So just to make sure you don't get confused, this is in fact an original model power creation, if you will. Anywho, with all that said, let's stop the, at the Javern and start, well, building a railroad here, if you will. Going to start setting the track up. It's pretty much assembles the same way as you would with easy track. You simply line the two pieces up, as we see here. Apply gentle pressure until they slip together. Also ensure the joining point is smooth so that there's no bump in order to avoid, well, trains going flying when they hit the joins as they come around the tracks. The track does go together with a reassuring click, but just again make sure the joiners are straight because that doesn't always happen, as again, in particular this track has been used, which seems to affect them. Anyway, let me go ahead and speed up this section so I don't bore you, as essentially this is kind of repetitive, as it is a simple 36-inch circle with nothing but the same type radius curves in it. And with that last reassuring click, let's now actually move on to the terminal track, which is not a re-railer in this case, interestingly enough. We can also now clearly see that this is most definitely not a Bachman <clears throat> track, as it not only is not a re-railer, as I mentioned before, but it still uses the prehistoric wire clamps to clamp the wires in position. Anywho, let's hurry up and get through the assembly parts so we can go ahead and take a look at how well this set runs. And with the tracks assembled, we move on to hooking up the transformer. Please note it should be unplugged at this point. We're going to connect the two power connections to the actual two-track wire to the two-track terminal on the transformer itself. To do this, we loosen the screw, place the hook in place, and then simply tighten the, tighten the screw itself down, making sure that the two wires don't cross on the top. And next, we'll connect those wires to the actual track itself. To do this, we press down the metal clamp and feed the track, through the, feed the track wire through the hole. Once this is in position, we simply release the clamp and the wire will be clamped securely into position. Please note again to twist the wires and to be careful. Again, these wires are known to cross and they can, especially if the clamps fail. So you got to be very careful with this. Again, if one, especially one who's setting up this train set is handy with a soldering iron, I recommend dipping the wires in some flux and applying some solder to make a better connection and also to reduce the likelihood that they will cross, as this will avoid uh, sort of rogue strands making contact with each other and causing a short and other such issues.
Okay, now that we have our tracks all joined and the wires plugged into the transformer and into the tracks themselves, it's time to put the cars on the track. There is no re-railer, but if you're an old hand like this, like myself, it's pretty simple to get done. If you're not, if you are not familiar with HO scale or any others gauge, simply grab the wheels of the train, carefully align them with the track as best you can, and move them. Try to move them back and forth. If you get any kind of hesitation or thumping, which would be the ties in the middle, you're not on the tracks. Just keep messing with them until they're straight. Now, once we have everything on the track, it's time to give her a, give her a try. We'll go grab the throttle and gently increase speed. Hmm, it seems like this set is a bit hesitant to get going here, and that's not surprising considering that I've heard this set was sitting around for a while. A little helping hand never hurt anything. But after a little messing around, we finally managed to get the set to start to run by itself, although admittedly not very well. Again, bringing the set back to life after sitting around never is an easy thing, as much like a car that's been sitting around for the same length of time. It just basically has, it basically takes a little exercise to get things going again, even if you do clean things out very thoroughly. Though admittedly, I didn't take a look at the internals of this engine, which which would simply confirm my suspicions. The three-pole motor clearly shows its heritage with its annoying growling and sort of rough running sound to it, although I have to admit this is the sort of thing I actually enjoyed listening to when I was a kid running the Bachmann versions of these engines. The three-pole motor isn't as much of a problem at higher speeds, but at slower speeds it causes the engine to become very jerky and unresponsive in some cases. Again, this is what you get for having a three-pole motor instead of a five-pole. about enough of that racket. This is not a refined train set. Let's take a look underneath the hood and see what makes this thing tick. Again, these Mahanos, especially of this era, are more or less a cheap inversion of the Atherin style drive system, only in this case with a three-pole motor. To get in, we don't actually have any screws. This is typical of this era. We have a single tab in the front, as well as two under the, ca under the cab itself. To release them, we place a small flathead screwdriver right underneath the cab in that little slot you see me using right there until the, ca until the tube tabs release. Once the tabs have been released, it's a matter of manhandling the frame off very carefully to get it to release. Again, this has never been opened as far as I can tell since it was new, and we immediately see the mechanics, as I mentioned, underneath the hood, as well as that annoying weight that was thrown in on some of these models with a questionable reason, as that is kind of near, electri uh, near electrical current. Not sure exactly why model power did that, but I did see it done. And as we look carefully at the motor, it is in fact filthy. It's hard to see, I know, from this shot, but there is a black stripe going down the actual commutator itself, which is not a good thing. Luckily, the fix for this issue is pretty simplistic. We just need some conductive loop and a small micro brush. As we can see here, I'm going to be using some of the easy command branded this lube. You can use any brand, but in this case, this is what I happen to have. This is conductive lubricant, and it is different from oil in that this will lubricate as well as enhance conductivity at the same time. You don't want to use oil, as that will tend to harm the brushes and or follow up the commutator, which is not a good thing. Anyway, to proceed is really quite simple. I'll just put a little bit into that little cap there, and I'm going to take that small micro brush, which is fern white. Please note at this time. Anywho, I'm just going to place it on top of the commutator and slowly rotate the motor manually by turning the shaft there. And I'm going to keep doing it until I've rotated the motor a few times over, and we'll see in a second just how shocking the results are. And again, keeping in mind that that brush was fern white when I started, as we can clearly tell it is anything but white right now. Ew, just look at that, it's all black, and that just shows to show you how much carbon it built up on this motor. Next, we're going to put just a few drops of Label 107 on each of the bearings to ensure that the motor is going to be able to turn freely. I actually overdid a little bit because that's a new bottle, it overran a little bit on me. You don't want to overdo this as you can cause problems with it, but at the same time, you want to make sure you just get a little oil on that. Once we're done lubricating the bearings, we'll go ahead and reassemble the locomotive itself. And once we're sure that everything's back together nice and tight, it's time to give this locomotive a test. And I can't think of a better place to test it than my new sort of modular type DC layout, which I recently put together to help me work on some upcoming projects that some of you may be aware of that I've been working on. Anyway, let's give her a whirl.
think we can see while slow speed is nothing to really marvel at, the locomotive runs very smoothly once we get slightly above the really low speeds. No hesitations, just nice and smooth. Unlike before, if you remember, it was stalling on every chance it got. Now let's crank up the speed and see what this baby can do. We also know how well the locomotive tackles the grades on this particular layout, despite the fact that it only has a three-pole motor, showing how valuable all-wheel drive can be on a, lo on a model train locomotive. Bottom line, like many model railroaders, I've always had a soft spot for Mahana locomotives, and this particular train set's a great value if you can find one. They are a little tricky to come by as model power is out of business right now, and possibly for the rest of its rest of, its, rest of all eternity. At any rate, you can locate them at train shows, and they are still very much a relevant part of model railroading. And if you can find one, I would strongly recommend picking it up, as that track can again go pretty much anywhere. It's just not as well refined as some of the other products out there. And before I close out, I'd like to again give credit to HOSeeker.net. If it wasn't for them, I couldn't do half the videos I do with their wealth of knowledge on the models. Again, they don't sponsor me. I'm just giving credit where credit is due. They have everything from literature to get your collection upgraded to schematics to help you repair your old vintage locomotive. Check them out at HOSeeker.net. And that's going to do it for this review. Thank you very much for watching. And again, if you liked it, thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. And like and, uh, Again, don't forget to subscribe. And again, keep the metal side down.